my whole life in two minutes. It's such a great pleasure to be here. I love the name of your organization, Girls Right Now. Not in 20 minutes or not tomorrow, but right at this moment. And, uh, and that's a great title, and I think it tells me a lot about, about who you are. Well, people here want to know about my writing, so I'll go right into that. And, and, uh, but I must say that I'm glad I showed you this because the writing came out of the acting. After being on Sesame Street for about eight years, uh, I wanted to continue to be part of the show, but I felt I had contributed all I could as an actor, and I decided to to do some writing. Now, of course, it wasn't that easy. I found myself going to a lot of meetings at Sesame Street, and they would ask me what I thought Maria should do. And I would give them some ideas, and lo and behold, they would use my ideas. So all of a sudden, I felt that made me, that empowered me because I felt that they, the very fact that they were validating my ideas meant that they were good. And then I decided to write some of the ideas myself. Of course, I knew all of the characters. I knew Oscar the Grouch. I knew exactly how he'd react. If you wanted to teach the alphabet, he would not want to do that. Uh, Big Bird would always want to do what you suggested, and I knew all of the human characters, so it was easy for me to write scenarios about them. I've been asked by uh, Tia, who interviewed me earlier, uh, if there was anything in my life in what I write, or if things that you experience fuel your writing, and I have to say that everything that you write comes from your experience. I could write for Big Bird and Ernie and Bert, and it'll be from my experience. And I can give you an example. When I was a kid, we used to hang out on the stoop in the summer, many families, and my parents would be the first family to go upstairs. And my cousin's family would stay out in the stoop hanging out, and I always imagined that as soon as we left, a great party happened or something fabulous happened that I missed. Well, one day I, I convinced my mother to let me hang out with my cousin, and I did, and nothing happened. <laughs> they just went upstairs about 10 minutes later. So I took that experience and I wrote a bit for Big Bird on Sesame Street when Susan and Gordon were trying to get him upstairs. And, and he doesn't want to, and I made the same scenario, but it was something that came from me. I did that with my children's picture books as well after writing for Sesame Street. I write occasionally for them still. I decided to write some picture books, and they were based from uh, another publisher, which I won't mention their name. <laughs> but, uh, and those were based on real experiences. We had an experience of going to the beach and um, piling up in cars, and, 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 and one day uh, we went to the beach and a neighbor had taken a dog, and we got there and there was a sign that said no dogs allowed, so it was a sorry day for us. But I took that experience and I made it um, a happy experience. Certainly, the revolution of Evelyn Serrano comes from a lot of my life experience. It happened in 1969, and that was a, a very important year for me. First of all, I first got cast at Sesame Street, and 1969 was an exciting time for the whole country. There were changes, uh, there were sit-ins, uh, people were occupying their college campuses. Women were writing for the, for the first time. I remember that uh, there were articles, there was a belligerent writer named Norman Mailer who used to say that women could not write, that that was a man's world. So uh, all of that stuff was changing in 1969, and I thought that would be a good time to place the story of this girl realizing who she is. Um, I was not because of a group, a militant group called the Young Lords who took over a neighborhood in El Barrio. The story is of Evelyn struggling between her mother and her grandmother. Her mother is very traditional, 
and her uh, grandmother is not. And she has to find what's good in both of them so that she can realize herself. And I went to my own feelings of being self-conscious about being Puerto Rican at that time. Uh, at that time, there were no uh, Latins on television. There were no people of color on television at all until Sesame Street had Susan and Gordon and, and, and cast me, or very few. And so I really felt invisible because I wasn't reflected in society. And, but at that time, when everything was changing in 1969, all of a sudden I was reflected in society and I was very interested in my culture. And I've taken those feelings that Sonia Manzano had in 1969 and given them to Evelyn Serrano in a uh, fictitious story that, that, that I've made up. So certainly, Everything that you write comes from you. Um, I've also been asked at this event, tips, everybody wants tips on writing. And I could certainly say that if you want to write, you should write every day. And something that I took me a while to learn, I thought that if I figured out the story in my head, and then write it was the way to go. And somebody's going, no, 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 no. So you've already realized that, that the very act of writing will make the story come out of your head. It's very intimidating to sit there with a blank page. But trust me, if you start writing, things will come to you. Uh, always, uh, if you ask people for advice about what you write, listen to what they say. Um, and I can tell you a little story about that. And this was the, the story of going to the beach in that first picture book that I wrote. I, I was telling friends how we always got lost and the car broke down and we always had to be in the shade and my parents didn't want to be in the sand and, and we had to wait for the uncle to come in from New Jersey and it was such a drag. And, and uh, you know, I was really looking for pity so they could tell me what a so sorry, how sorry they felt for me from my terrible childhood. But the friend said, isn't that wonderful, all the trouble that your parents went, to, went through to get you to the beach? <laughs> well, story changed, right? <laughs> it started out to be a tragedy, but this person's reaction to it uh, made me see something else in it. So when people react to things that you write, I would encourage you to just listen and, and uh, you know, if you wrote a story that's the tragedy that nobody showed up for your sweet 16 birthday party and everybody's chuckling about it, then you didn't, you didn't accomplish what you set out to do. So you either change it or, uh, uh, or go with the flow, make it a comedy, if, if, if that's uh, how things are going. Uh, I also write because it gives me an opportunity to reflect if there's problems, and everybody always has problems all the time. Uh, you can sit down and get away from it by creating your own world and really fe feeling pretty strong that you, you could make the ending that you want happen. Uh, and that's very empowering, and uh, you can certainly reflect on that. There's lots of, me lots of uh, kinds of writing. Um, I, I only read, I don't read any, uh, I only read fiction usually. I don't read any nonfiction unless it's a memoir or a bio, and my husband reads, reads the opposite. There is essay writing, and you don't have to always write about a deep, dark, terrible thing that happened to you. You can write an essay about how you feel about the lunchroom, or you know, you know, write it from the point of view of a piece of bread. If a bread could talk, what it would say. I mean, you could look at things from, from different perspectives, and it'll free you up. And go with the thing that's easy to write. You know, go with uh, if it's uh, you know a singing broccoli, then that's what and that turns you on. Then uh, uh, oh, you're all giggling. Has somebody written a singing broccoli uh, chapter? Maybe, maybe. Um, the other thing I want to say is that. Um, 
The mechanics of writing is very important, and, and I still struggle with that. Um, sadly, when I went to elementary school, they didn't teach that very well, so I had to learn it later, and it's, uh, it's arduous to me, but it's very, very important. And, uh, and it's important because if you think of the punctuation as notes, like a song, it kind of helps you express the words better. And the person who is reading it will understand certainly uh, what you mean if it has a reasonably good punctuation. Because you you're giving the reader clues as to what uh, you want them to feel. Uh, I'll read a little bit from my book. Is this a good time to do it? Oh, yeah? OK. I have a, somebody's going to give me the Uh, this is a wonderful, I think this is such a fabulous image. And you could see that this hand is trying to cover the sun or the sky or some sunlight. And I, and I think uh, this illustrator really nailed, nailed it, the sense of the book in this, in this book cover. There's a Puerto Rican expression that says, some people try to tapar el cielo con la mano to cover the sky with their hand. That was mommy. She was always covering up what she didn't want to see or putting something pretty on top of something ugly. The picture of her father on the dresser in her bedroom was another good example of mommy's bad decorating skills. That thing had both roses and the tapete. The fakeness of the plastic roses matched the fakeness of the photo. Like in all the old fashioned pictures I had seen from Puerto Rico, the photographer had decided to make it better by coloring it in and putting lipstick and blush on Abuelo, whose thin black mustache looked super stupid with all that makeup. <laughs> um, little did I know that Abuelo's life was my mother's ultimate act of tapando el cielo con la mano. I wish mommy would have just demanded that the landlord paint our apartment. Whenever I asked her about calling the landlord, she said, we don't have to paint. We're not going to live here forever. Someday we'll buy a house in the Bronx. Yeah, she did want to buy a house in the Bronx, but really, mommy was too afraid of the landlord to complain. When it came to standing up for herself, she was as frail and delicate as one of her tapetes. Since my room was off limits to mommy's decorating and plastic roses and anything lacy, the walls were creamy beige. I had a corduroy bedspread that was once yellow but had been washed so many times, it was faded to almost white, just the way I liked it. My bare dresser without a tapete on it stood in the corner, and a table I found on 110th Street served as a desk. I painted the dresser and the table white. With mommy still in the kitchen holding her egg pan in one hand and her iron in the other, I got dressed. I was tucking my shirt into my A-line skirt when Pops busted into my room. What are you doing, he shouted. You should be helping your mother. My stepfather had been acting super parental lately. I just looked at him. I want you to take out the garbage. If you can't help in the bodega, you can help more in the house. In Puerto Rico, a young girl knows her place, knows that she should help her mother. What are you, a hippie? <laughs> Pops had an issue with hippies. Malcriados sin vergüenzas, shameless spoiled kids, he called them. Before I could answer, my mother stepped in behind Pop saying, that's OK, I'll take out the garbage. My mother the slave was all I could think. <laughs> that was sort of in 69, was the height of the hippie culture, so all of these naked girls in Woodstock dancing around were really in frightening to many of many adults. And Pops is, is one of those adults who was very frightened by the looseness of, of that time. OK, so I think we're uh, enough about me. <laughs> now we're here to, uh, to attend to the real serious business and what's important. And we're going to hear some stories. So I'd like to, from uh, Girls Right Now, 
So I'd like to call the first two victims, I mean writers up. <laughs> uh, so let's please welcome Menti Sulima Cuellar and her mentor, Pam Bayless. Thank you very much.